Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. Can everybody hear okay with the audio? Yeah? Good. Yeah, it's a real pleasure for me to be here to speak to you about this subject. Uh, interest of full disclosure, I was one of Marc Andre's professors. In fact, the very first theology class which he took at Concordia was my class, and he kind of took it on a dare, from what I understand. Uh, whether or not he would take it, he wasn't too sure. Uh, now you're an honors major in theology, I think. So, uh, Professor uh, Tuchescu, the finder's fee for getting another honors student. I'm still waiting for the, uh, the check. But nevertheless, I'm hoping that uh, this subject tonight, which is, it is complex, uh, I am going to try and address it in a manner that is, uh, first of all, worthy of theology students who are doing their honors degree, but also is accessible to anyone who is just quite literally coming in off the street. Uh, this was announced on the internet, it was announced on my blog, through Facebook, so anyone who's here, whether you have a theological background or not, whether you're, you're Catholic, Christian, or whatever, you're most welcome, and I hope that this will be uh, informative for all of us. I like talking about the Trinity. I like talking about the Trinity because from the point of view of being a religious believer, I basically get to spend an hour or whatever time it is, talking about my best friends. The Trinity is not just a doctrine. It's a teaching about three divine people with whom we can enter into a relationship. And so I'm hoping that through the, the presentation of this, I'll be able to get across not only my interest in the subject, but my passion for it. Because for me, as I say, the study of the Trinity has not simply been uh, an intellectual exercise in philosophy or the history of religion, for me it really has nourished my life of prayer. It has nourished uh, my life of relationship with God. And so, you know, I have to talk about my friends in a way that expresses that, and I hope that will come across as well. Now, in order to break down our subject tonight, I thought we would address the issue of the Trinity through looking at uh, three questions. Three questions. God is a trinity. What? So what? And now what? In other words, what does it mean? When we say God is a trinity, what does it mean? There is a content to that teaching, so what is that content? Then, so what? God is a trinity? Great, very nice, but what's the big deal? What, what does that change? What, in our understanding of God, our relationship with God, for example, what would that modify? And then, now what? Okay, so we, we see God's a trinity, we understand that it's important for X, Y, Z reasons. What next? How does that become something that influences our day-to-day -day life? Or our understanding of the world and our place in it? What's the next action? that comes out of that. These three questions, they're, they're mine, but they're inspired actually by a talk that I heard given in this very room, uh, gosh, at least 15 years ago, by an Orthodox bishop, Callistos Ware. Bishop Callistos Ware is very well known as a presenter of the Orthodox tradition to Western audiences, and uh, he has that particular gift and skill, and his books are very well known for that. And uh, he's a very charming person when you meet him, and his, his talk was very charming. But I remember he challenged the audience, saying, if you're a Christian, but your belief in the Trinity is vague, or it's not part of your actual practical spirituality, then perhaps there's something in that Christianity that we have that for our own lives is weak, is unclear, needs to be strengthened. I walked away from that talk, and that was in many ways sort of the seed that got me thinking, okay, yeah, I believe God's a trinity, I've been making the sign of the cross my, my whole life, but what did it change? What does it change? And so it really was for me the seed of that reflection. And so what you're getting tonight is uh, the fruit of of study, but also reflection, particularly since that time. So what does the word Trinity mean? 
First important thing to make absolutely clear is that Christians definitely believe that there is only one God. So Christianity is a monotheistic religion. There is only one God. However, Christians also believe that there are three somethings in God. I, I use the word somethings, I put it in quotes, simply because the term that has been used that you know, replaces somethings, sometimes it can vary depending upon context, language, etc. The classic formula is to say that God is one usia and three hypostasis. Now, I use the Greek words there because, frankly, they're difficult to translate. And so, in many ways, if we want to express the teaching, the belief in the Trinity in its most accurate and precise form that has come down to us through tradition, we've actually got to use those words. Now, what do they normally mean? How are they commonly translated? Well, usia is sometimes translated as one substance. There is one substance or one essence. But those aren't perfect translations. They've come down to us through tradition, but you always, I mean, if you ever read a text on it, you'll see lots of footnotes and pages and pages of discussion of those particular words. Sometimes it's translated as there is one being, one fact of being, one source of being. Those are variations on the theme. So that's kind of what it means. To say that there are three hypostases, that's the three somethings. The word hypostasis, if you were to translate it into Latin literally, would be substance. Three substances. But it doesn't mean, often in English when we use the word substance, what we mean is three categories of substance. What this means is three, in some ways, uh, distinct or individuated substances. Of course, then, the danger when we start to go in that road is how do we avoid the Trinity being understood as sort of splitting off into three separate things? That's always the challenge. How can you have one God in three somethings without the three sort of taking over and conquering the notion of the one. A common formula to try and, and express this again is one God in three persons. Hypostasis, rather than being translated as substance, has sometimes been translated as person. Um, again, how do we avoid that being understood as three gods? So there are often qualifiers that get added. One qualifier is consubstantial. So, in other words, those three persons, nevertheless, are sort of glued together, overlap in this one notion of substance, of usia. Of course, that's where, you know, terminology gets difficult, and when you start to study theology, you find lots of footnotes in the book, but that's part of it. Very often, another qualifier gets added, divine, three divine persons to show that there is a perfect equality between the three, perfect harmony between the three in their divinity. It's not like you have one who is God and two that are demigods. They really are three co-equal, consubstantial, divine persons united in this one usia. Now, if you've understood that, you don't need to stick around for the rest of our talk tonight because it should all be clear, but in the event that for probably the vast majority of us, there is, uh, we're still wondering, what the heck does this mean? Well, that's what the rest of this talk is. And this has been part of the attempt through the centuries in Christianity to explain this very fact. One God, three somethings, three hypostases, how do we uh, relate those things? So let's start with something simple. How is the Trinity named? Let's at least get our terminology, our, our titles. There are various kinds of titles for the Trinity. The most common of the three persons is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are relational titles, which we see something particularly 
in the first two, father and son. Because you can't be a father without being a father to somebody. It's a relational title. You can't be a son without being a son of somebody. It's a relational title. So these I, I categorize as relational titles, and they're the ones that are heard most frequently as labels to apply to the three hypostases. Where, when you read the literature, you'll often come across numerical titles, where instead of saying the Father, it'll say the first person of the Trinity, or the first person of the Blessed Trinity, or the first person of the Most Blessed Trinity, or the first person of the Most Holy and Blessed Trinity. Sometimes they expand, but the point is first. If you hear first person, it's referring to the Father. If you hear second person in the Trinity, it's referring to the Son. Third person, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. There are also what I call theological titles. I call them theological titles because each of these titles uses the word God, Theos, in the title. So very often when we read the New Testament and we see the word God, it's actually referring to the Father. That's what we, it's often connected that way. When we see reference to, references to the wisdom of God, the word of God, the logos of God, the son of God, then that is referring to the second person. Obviously son is in the original section. And then spirit of God is referring to Holy Spirit. These are expressions. Now why are they important? It's the word of. It's the word of. You notice that the first one is not the Father of God. That's an expression you won't find in common Christian theology. You'll find the expression Son of God or Spirit of God, but you won't find Father of God. What you'll find is God the Father. And so this is very important. It's a reality, a nuance, that has influenced the development of teaching on the Trinity. Um, but you can also see there's a difficulty that sometimes people get caught up in, and that is that the word God has to be understood in a context. There are times when the word God is referring to the Trinity as a whole, but there also will be times when the word God is referring simply to the Father. There's no contradiction between these two uses because, first of all, the three persons are consubstantial, as I said earlier, but also you just have to read it in the context that the passage is being written in. So, for example, at a certain point when Jesus says to Mary, Mag Mary Magdalene, do not cling to me because I will be ascending to my Father and your Father, I will be ascending to my God and your God, obviously, he's referring to the Father as God in that particular passage. It comes across pretty clear in that particular passage. But there are other times when Thomas, the doubter, encounters the risen Jesus after the resurrection. He looks at him and he says, my Lord and my God. He's referring to the divinity of the person in front of him, who is Jesus. He's not referring to the Father. He's referring to that divinity that he's seeing in the Son of God. So it's important, just, I'm just making you aware of this so that in case you're reading the literature and you, you see that it's used differently and you're wondering what it means, it's just good to be aware that this particular nuance is important. It will occasionally come up in what you come across. Now I'd raised the issue earlier, how is tritheism avoided? How do we avoid as Trinitarian believers from going from monotheism into tritheism. This is, as you can imagine, one of the most common critiques of the Christian understanding of God. Very often, people sort of sit back and they say, well, come on, one plus one plus one is three. If you've got three divine persons, you've got three gods. You know, why are you Christians fooling yourselves by saying you've got three, but you've really only got one. Um, you know, I always reassure those people that Christians actually can count. We are, we are able to do that. But it is a, it is a worthy question, because it's not obvious. So the first point to understanding how this tritheism is avoided is precisely in that nuance I raised earlier, that you'll never hear Father of God 
you'll always hear God the Father. This is the principle that the Father is the sole source, the mono arche, of the other persons of the Trinity. The word monarch comes from this mono arche. It means the sole source. So you will sometimes read the uh, uh, expression, the Father is the monarch of the Trinity. I've, I've seen that in some of the older writings. Somewhat unusual, but it's an attempt to express this concept. Uh, arche means, in this context, source. You've heard of archaeology, the study of origins. So that is the sole origin, the sole source of the persons of the Trinity. There is, for the you know, sake of full disclosure, there is a debate between Eastern Christian theology and Western Christian theology as to the role of the Son in this process of generation of the persons. Uh, I won't get into that too much tonight, if maybe in the Q&A, but at the, just wanted to put it out there. There is that debate that exists. But there is a, a common understanding in Christian theology that the Father, as this source, pours into, in a sense, into the Son and into the Spirit all that he has. He gives them the total gift of self. And that is why they would be fully divine. If he totally gives everything that he is to them, then they must necessarily be divine like him. They become, in a sense, him in these other persons. So he gives them everything he is except the fact of being father. One is the source, others receive. That is a distinction between them. But nevertheless, that is part of the understanding of how this tritheism is avoided. Because it's coming from a single source, that maintains the unity of the person. And point number two is something that was expressed very powerfully, in particular, by Augustine of Hippo, uh, doctor of the church from the fifth century. He, he highlighted a passage that is found in the first letter of John where John says, God is love. One of the, frankly, most commented passages of the New Testament. God is love. What does this mean? It means that God is not merely loving. It means that God's very substance is love. What is God made out of? Little kids will sometimes ask. God is made out of love. That is God's very fundamental substance. And so if God is love and is not merely loving, see, if God was merely loving, then in theory, God could turn it off. You know, God could select where that love is being directed, you might say. God could hate. But if God is love, then it would be contrary to God's very nature to not love. It would be a form of divine suicide almost, to not love. If God is love, that is, or that teaching is really fundamental to the Christian understanding of God. But, here's the thing, and something that uh, Augustine had pointed out, you can't be love from all eternity, unless from all eternity you've had someone to love. Love is naturally oriented towards its object. So if you are love from all eternity, and from all eternity there is also a recipient, an object of that love. Which means that from all eternity, if God is love, not just loving, but if God is love, then from all eternity, you have at least three things. The lover, the beloved, and the love between them. The love that is shared and returned between them. What is it that prevents the Trinity from splitting off into being three persons, totally autonomous and independent? What is it that prevents it from 
becoming three gods is love. Love is the nature of God. That very nature gives rise to the Trinitarian aspect of God's nature, but also keeps it perfectly united. That is absolutely critical to understanding this concept. So the required necessary set, as I said, it's necessary. Those relations are necessary if God is love. And this set of substantial relations, in other words, those relations are so powerful that it gives rise to these persons in God, it explains how any splitting of the Trinity would be impossible. That's how the unity is achieved, how it is maintained, how it's built in to the very nature of God. Now, in trying to explain the triune God throughout the centuries, because, let's face it, not everybody who's asking this question is coming to university lecture halls. Uh, we sometimes get different questions from people of all walks of life, and they want to try and grasp this. They want to see how it's intelligible. There are various approaches that have been used on a practical level to try and explain this. The plant you see there is an Irish shamrock, the three-leaf clover, as we often call it. And this is a, a traditional Trinitarian symbol. When St. Patrick went to Ireland and preached among the Celts there, according to uh, the stories from that time, in order to try and explain the Trinity, he used a living symbol. The Irish people were very close to nature. So he used the living symbol they were familiar with, and he pulled it out and he said, you see, there are three leaves, but there's only one plant. And so everybody went, oh. And they then became Christian. So it worked. <laughs> it worked. For them. I'm not sure you could, you could pull that off in another culture, but it has traditionally come down to us as a symbol of the Trinitarian doctrine. Uh, when I was, shortly after being ordained a priest, I was going to a catechism class being offered in a school. It was the grade six class, and you, could, you got the impression they, they weren't super excited to be there. And uh, I walk into the classroom, and the catechist, who's got this kind of panicked look on her face, says, oh, thank goodness you're here, Father Tom. I could really use your help. And I look on the blackboard, and there's a shamrock. I thought, let me guess, the Trinity. And, and you, you could see in the eyes of the kids, they wanted to understand it, but simply drawing a, a shamrock on the blackboard was not helping them necessarily to get it. So she said, can you, can you help us to try and understand this? And I said, well, I'll, I'll try and come up with another catechetical metaphor. And so kind of on the spot, I borrowed one of their uh, music players. In those days, it wasn't iPods, it was portable CD players, but it's the same concept. So I'm borrowing this one tonight in order to share with you this other catechetical example. So the music player is an analogy or a metaphor. It's a metaphor for the Trinity, where the player itself, this is the source right? This is the source, and it's the thing that when we think music player, our concept in our mind goes to a device like this. This is what comes up in our mind. So, much like with the Trinity, when we think of God, we're thinking of, even if we don't know it, we're thinking of God the Father, who is the source. So this is God the Father. Now, the headphones, these, in the analogy, would represent God the Son. God the Son, who comes from the Father, flows, in a sense, out of the Father, but is perfectly united to the Father. And so, let's imagine, for example, you were to ask somebody, hey, can I... Uh, borrow your music player, I want to listen to that song you told me about, and the person were to say, great, sure, I'll lend it to you, pulls out the headphones and just gives you the device, you would say to yourself, well, no, I, I want the whole music player. Well, is this the music player, or is the music player both of them together? 
It depends on what angle you're looking at it, right? What definition you're giving to the word music player. Just like when we say God, sometimes referring strictly to the Father, but sometimes we're referring to the Son. And so, under Christian teaching, the Son comes, flows out of the Father, perfectly united to the Father, in a sense, one with the Father, only makes sense, understood as one. Let's imagine you were to uh, be walking around downtown, and you were to see somebody walking around with headphones in their ears, but uh, not actually connected to anything. That would be a little strange. This, the headphones make no sense on their own. They only have meaning if they are connected. So that's also a core notion of the Son. The Son of God. The word Son can only be understood in reference to the Father. Finally, we may be wondering who's the Holy Spirit in all this. Any guesses? It's the music. Exactly. The music flows from the Father and the Son, or through the Son, depending on whether you're an Eastern or a Western Christian, from the Father and the Son through the Son. Where does it go? Where does the music go? Into your ears, exactly. And through your ears, into your brain, and into your mind. And that's a really important notion as well for explaining why Christians believe that the Son became a human being, became incarnate. Because the Son is perfectly adapted to plug into the Father and be united, but through his human nature is adapted for us to be connected to him. And with us connected to the Father through the Son, we receive the Holy Spirit. We're part of the network. We're part of the unity. Now, I have to admit, I'm very proud of this analogy. I like it better than the shamrock. Um, but I can understand the Irish did not have music players in those days, so, uh, and the shamrock worked for them, so that's great. And who knows? You know, there will come a day when our music players are, you know, I don't know, wired into our skulls, and so the analogy won't work anymore. But for now, for now, I think it helps people to uh, see, in some ways, how the relationships are intelligible, they do make sense, and also how we become uh, part of that relationship, which is a very important part of our spirituality. Now, all of that being said, that analogy or that metaphor has its limits, because, to be blunt, the father is not a music player. Okay, and the son is not a set of headphones. You can only take a metaphor so far. It helps us to see that this doctrine is intelligible, that it can make sense. It's not just people who don't know how to count. But at the same time, we do need to push it a bit further. Genuine attempts to explain the Trinity, therefore, push into the realm of metaphysics. In fact, Western philosophy, particularly metaphysics, its development was in many ways driven by attempts to understand this Trinitarian reality. Uh, an example of uh, that that I like to, to use to explain it is, for example, let's see, I'll find a coin here, a penny. All right. You folks see that I'm holding this coin in my hand, correct? Hello? Yes? Excellent. So, I definitely have something in my hand. There is something there. It exists. Okay. Is this an elephant? Is it a pizza? Is it a cloud? No. So not only does it exist, not only does it have being, it also has essence. It has a definition of what it is. Right? Because if it changed its essence, then it would change what it is. It would become an elephant or a pizza or a cloud. So everything that exists 
at least has two things. It has being and it has essence. And those two things are united. If you take away its being, it just doesn't exist anymore. And if you take away its essence, then it's something different. It's no longer what it was. In addition, everything which exists has a third component, something that we sometimes miss, and that is that it is relevant to other things. It is connected to other things. This coin does not exist in a parallel universe. It is not existing in some other dimension, such that if I were to toss it to someone, She's able to see it as it comes. She's able to reach out her hands in order to catch it. It is, in a sense, revealing itself, its nature and its location as it is flying towards her. If it was an elephant that had been tossed at her, she would have run to get out of the way instead of trying to catch it. So it's not just it's revealing its existence, it's also revealing its essence, and it's doing it in a way relevant to her. So there's a principle that it possesses that allows it to reveal itself to another being, in this case, you. Everything which exists possesses these three qualities. Existence, essence, a principle of revelation. Well, God exists, God has an essence, and God is able to reveal himself. The one who exists is the Father. The principle of revelation is the Son, the one who reveals the Father. And the principle of essence, what it is, is the Spirit. That's a metaphysical analogy, not just a metaphor, but an analogy. But it's also very important because it reveals in some ways, you could almost say the functions of each person within the inner life of the Trinity. And it's also interesting because it implies that when God created the world, the world is stamped with his image. God has existence, essence, and a principle of revelation, and so did that coin. There's a stamp of God's Trinitarian nature built into everything which exists, because everything which exists has those three things. If it didn't, it wouldn't be. It just wouldn't be. And you notice, by the way, there's only one coin. It's not three coins that split off. Being, essence, principle of revelation, three things, but perfectly united together in that one reality. One God, three persons. One coin, three elements of its reality, but still one coin. Now, how do we know that God is a trinity? Well, first we'll take a look at the Father. The divinity of the Father is basically a given. You look at the history of Christian theology, there's never been really any serious attempts to deny the divinity of the Father. Those who deny the divinity of the Father are usually busy denying the existence of God, period. So, and it would be a little strange to say that the Father is not divine, but the Son is. That would be a little odd. So, really, this has never been seriously challenged. With regards to the wisdom, word, logos, son of God, there are hints of the divinity of God's wisdom, the title wisdom being applied. The hints of divinity of God's wisdom in the Old Testament, I put up here Proverbs 8, 22 to 31, in which, and there are other passages in which wisdom is either spoken of or seems to speak of itself as being co-eternal with God, being present with God. It's not an explicit reference. It never comes out and says, and I happen to be the second person of the Trinity. You won't find that. But you will find these hints, such that when we look back, we can detect them in the uh, Old Testament, particularly. Now, the divinity of the Word of God is explicit in the New Testament. It's pretty in your face, actually, when you read the Gospel of John, the opening passages. In the beginning was the Word, the Greek word is logos, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Ta-da, there you go. So this is a principle of revelation in the Bible regarding the divinity of the word. So if you've got your New Testament, you definitely are going to be confronted with the divinity or a second person that is being called God. You're definitely going to be confronted with that. Regarding the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the divinity of the Holy Spirit is not mentioned explicitly in the New Testament, but is implied through an inclusion with the Father and Son in Trinitarian references. One of the classic ones is in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus tells his disciples, go out into the whole world, make disciples of all the nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You have that triplet mention that comes out. Or this particular element of greeting or farewell from St. Paul, 2 Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. A reference which uh, certainly Roman Catholics hear quite often at Mass. It's part of the greeting that is offered to people formally at the beginning of Mass. It's a direct quote from this passage in the Bible. So you see, the Holy Spirit is being included in an equal way with two other divine persons. So it's the common understanding is that this is an implied reference to the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Something that was confirmed centuries later, but in a, an explicit way, but certainly present implicitly. So now we get to our question, so what if God is a trinity? This is the what. By now your brains may be exploding, I realize that, but in case we, we're still able to go on, it's interesting to then tackle, so what? What difference does this make? Christian tradition teaches that God is knowable through something called general revelation. General revelation uh, is the understanding that God is revealed in his works. God is revealed particularly in the act of creation, as we study creation. The analogy that I like to use is that of an artist. If you study a painting or a set of paintings by an artist, you can know certain things about that artist. At the very least, you can guess that the person existed because otherwise the painting wouldn't be there. Somebody made it. So the existence of the artist is certainly directly inferable from the fact that there's art. Now you might also be able to guess certain facts. You know, sometimes artists go through periods in their life where they focus on themes, uses of certain colors, uses of, you know, particular kinds of paintings. And so, you know, the art historians will write theses on what the artist was going through psychologically at that point that influenced their art. Uh, you can guess things about the artist based on the artist's uh, works. Certainly the thing you know best is they existed. Other things it's a bit more difficult to discern, but some things you can also guess. Of course, and this, uh, this reality relates to God. If God is an artist and creates the universe as a work of art, then the idea is it should be possible to infer the existence of God through a philosophical reflection on the nature of creation, the nature of the universe. And this is something that uh, is referred to in Paul's letter to the Romans. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So. Part of Christian belief, interestingly, is that you don't have to be a Christian to come to belief in God. That this basic form of revelation is accessible to all of the cultures of the world throughout history through philosophical reflection on the meaning of life, on the meaning of existence. So I remember chatting with someone who said, why isn't that enough? I mean, if that's available to everybody, why isn't it enough? Why can't we just stop there? Why do we have to go on? Why is it important to consider God as a trinity? What difference does God as trinity make for us? 
If God is love, remember, God, part of the Christian understanding is God is love. If God is love, then he is not merely loving. Love is his fundamental substance. I'm reiterating something I said before. If God is love, he is necessarily eternally relational. For God to be relational is part of God's very nature. And this means that the possibility of relationship with God can be extended to us. What I had on the previous slide, this God who is the source of being for the universe, that's a kind of very impersonal view of God. That's not a warm and fuzzy God. You know, that's a, a God of awesome deity and majesty, it is true, but it would be easy to slip into a view of God as some kind of cosmic energy force, not necessarily a God of love. That's not a necessary conclusion from that previous analysis. Christianity adds that God is love, which means that it is possible to enter into a relationship with God. And when we do enter into that relationship, because God is relationship himself, we're actually entering into the divine life. It's no longer God over there, me over here. It's entering into that divine life. And the classic image to represent this is something that was on our poster for this event. This is a, an icon of the Trinity. What you're seeing is actually the icon, an image of the icon that I use to pray with when I do my personal prayer in the morning. I have it on a little stand and I, I have a little prayer bench that I kneel on and uh, contemplate this image. And you may be thinking to yourselves, this guy's been staring at the same picture for 10 years. It must get, uh, get kind of dry. Quite the reverse, actually. Just to give you a quick explanation, the figure on the left, that is the figure of the father. That represents the Father. You see the other two figures are turned towards the Father. That is expressing how they draw their source. And you see their heads are bowed. It's showing that they draw their source from the Father. Now the figure in the middle, that's the Son. We know it's the Son through well, there are various elements of the icon, but the one that's particularly significant is these two fingers on the table. The two fingers are symbolic of the divine and human nature of Jesus. That's a little clue in the image who it is we're talking about. And the image on the right, that's, well, I guess, process of elimination, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, there's obviously a lot more to this. There's the tree, there's the house, there's the mountain up here. But the point is, this is an image of the Trinity. Now, why is the Trinity being represented as these three figures? sitting around a table with a, some food in the middle. This is drawn from a passage in the book of Genesis where Abraham met God. God went to go meet Abraham, but appeared to Abraham in the form of three persons. Remember how I said there were some hints, hints in the Old Testament tradition? That's Christians consider that one of the big hints. It's pretty in your face when you start to uh, realize God actually is a trinity. Well, that's the three figures. What does Abraham do when he meets them? He greets them. He addresses them in the singular. He doesn't say, my lords. He says, my lord. And then he goes and gets them something to eat because you have to show hospitality to your guests. And so this is the meal which they were served and they're sitting around eating together. But there is an important addition, important figure that also can be added to this image. Who is sitting here at the table? Who is at this place? The person looking at the picture. There's an open space at the table Sitting around the table sharing a meal is a symbol of relationship and communion. There's a fourth place opened up to the viewer. This icon is an image 
of the invitation that God offers to join in the divine life. That's heaven. Heaven is sharing in the divine life. If you read the descriptions of heaven from different religious traditions, you will often find very vivid descriptions of, you know, rivers of gold and the place of eternal delights and vivid, vivid descriptions of the pleasures of heaven. You don't find much of that in the Christian tradition. Actual material descriptions of heaven, no. What you do get is the understanding that heaven is not so much a place as it is a state of being. It is an experience of perfect love because you're entering into the divine life itself, which is love. Little kids will sometimes ask me, what's heaven like? What's it going to be like? And I tell them, picture the time in your life when you felt the most loved and multiply that by a million and you're starting to understand what heaven will be like. It's got nothing to do with what we'll see or taste or touch. It's about entering into the infinite love of God. So, if God is a trinity, what difference does it make? Well, it certainly influences our, our understanding of heaven. Because God is a trinity is tied to the notion that God is love. And if God is love and trinitarian relationship and all that, well, friends, this is what we have to look forward to. My point of view, pretty awesome. I am looking forward to this. Not too soon, mind you, but I am looking forward to this. And part of the notion is not just that we enter into the divine life, but that the divine life can enter into us. If God is a trinity, then he can communicate, not just his words, not just his message, he can communicate his very being. His very being can be communicated, such that something can be filled with the presence of God and truly become holy. Holy because it is filled with that present. This principle is called condescension. Uh, in English, the word to be condescending is an insult. But in fact, condescension literally means to descend, to be with. Con means with, and descension, to descend. So the idea is that God could, without losing what it means to be God, also adapt himself in the way he presents himself to be accessible to us. We are not God. So if we're going to have any genuine relationship with God, then condescension is necessary. It has to be a mercy that God gives us. Otherwise, God will be always infinitely remote and will be stuck just being creatures. But God, in love and mercy, can condescend not just communicate his message, but his very being can enter into our reality without losing anything of what it means to be God. Hint, that's the Christian understanding of Jesus. That's the Christian understanding of the Incarnation. The pre-existent, eternally existent Word of God descends to be with us adapting, or adopting, I should say, taking on human nature. Not just, Jesus is important, not just because of what he said, not just because of what he did, but because of who he is. How did, how did he pull that off? What was necessary for that to happen? Remember how I said, I used the analogy of the coin, and I said the Holy Spirit is the essence? communicates the essence of God? Well, if you read uh, the story of the, the birth of Jesus and the, uh, the uh, uh, incarnation, you know, when, when the conception by Mary of Jesus, the angel Gabriel says to her, she asks, how is this going to happen? 
I'm a virgin. How's this going to happen? And we can presume she was not ignorant of biology. So she knew it wasn't going to happen the normal way. How is this going to happen? And the angel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit, as that essence of God, is able to allow, in a sense, the union, perfect union, between Jesus' divine nature and his human nature. Perfect God, perfect humanity, not some weird blend, not half and half, 100% God, 100% human, perfectly united in a non-confused but, but truly united way. That is the Christian understanding of the Incarnation, which depends upon Trinity and depends upon God being relational, which depends upon God being love. Christians believe that God has, in fact, as I say, done this in Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. Why did Jesus come? Because God is love. It's an expression of, Jesus's, of God's love, the coming of Jesus in the Holy Spirit. Now, if the Trinity is true, now what? We've looked at the what and the so what, now what? Belief in God as a trinity is necessarily tied to belief in Jesus as the word of God incarnate, having both a divine nature and a human nature. As I put here, the doctrine of the trinity would never have been articulated without reflection and even controversies around the identity of Jesus as son of God. In other words, in theory, in theory, you could believe in a trinity that never undertook the incarnation. After all, before Jesus, the Trinity hadn't undertaken it yet. So in theory, you could believe in a Trinity that hadn't undertaken the Incarnation. But the bottom line is, we would never even be using the word Trinity unless it had happened. So unless somebody was presenting themselves in that claim. So it would be kind of silly to say, well, I believe in God as a Trinity, but I don't believe it's Jesus who's the Son of God. That's how we got there in the first place. You know, the two go together. Now what? all are invited to believe in Jesus as Lord and so enter the divine life. If Jesus really is the Word of God incarnate, then he's got those two natures. I use my music player. One nature is plugged into God to never be unplugged, plugged into his Father. And the other nature, perfectly adapted, because it's truly human, it's not some weird hybrid, truly human to be adapted to us. And so we're being given an offer. The offer is to join in the divine life and the doorway into that is faith in Jesus, the Son of God incarnate. It's the, it's, it's the quick way in, you might say. It's the pathway to enter into the fullness of that divine life, as full as we can get, certainly, in this life that we have now. There are ritual expressions in the Christian tradition that are uh, meant to be instruments of entering the divine life. From the Acts of the Apostles, we read, uh, this is from the Feast of Pentecost, where the apostles and the disciples were scared, they were in this room, locked up for fear of the authorities. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes to them. And they're filled with pep. And they're filled with courage. And they start to speak in strange tongues. And so they, they rush out and they, they're praising God in the public sphere. So much so that people thought they were drunk. They were so exuberant. And so Peter stands up and he gives a speech in which he says, no, no, they're not drunk too early in the day to be drinking. They're not drunk. And he starts to explain what's going on. And the, according to the scripture passage, the people hear it and they are cut to the heart and they ask, brethren, what shall we do? You've told us this, but now what? What shall we do? And so Peter answers, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's as opposed to the name of John the Baptist, who had also been doing some baptisms. Be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Remember how I said that if God is relational, it's possible for God to enter into creation? The incarnation of Jesus is the most perfect example of that. But through the Holy Spirit, it is possible for us to be vessels of the Holy Spirit. This, this fact is the heart of Christian spirituality. If you're doing theology projects on spirituality, this is the core element that, in a sense, justifies what spirituality is from a Christian point of view. The idea that it's not us striving, it's the Holy Spirit in us with whom we cooperate. That's the fundamental feature of Christian spirituality. The real initiative taker is God. And we collaborate and cooperate and make room for the Holy Spirit in us. And baptism is the ritual, sacrament, by which this indwelling of the Holy Spirit can be made possible, can be made real. There's this other passage in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, where Jesus gives a, a talk about... Uh, he says to them, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And people are pretty turned off by that notion. Can't understand why, but uh, that's a joke, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah what is, what's this guy saying? He's going to give us his flesh to eat. This is weird. And Jesus tells them, no, 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 I mean it. You've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to have life in you. Some of his disciples even walk away. The passage says some of them stopped following him. They, they couldn't take that teaching. But Jesus certainly clarifies it at the Last Supper when he takes bread and he says, take this, eat it, this is my body. And he takes a cup of wine and he says, take this, drink of it, this is my blood. So the flesh and the blood that we eat and drink come to us in a sacramental form under the forms of bread and wine. Remember the Trinity picture I had up there? There's the three figures sitting around a bowl. First I used to think that was a fruit bowl or something, you know, that uh, maybe is some pistachios, I don't know. But I discovered later when I was visiting uh, a, an Orthodox church, a Byzantine church, that the chalice the cup that is used is often very shallow and broad and that the wine that is placed in it, the bread is uh, baked in a particular way that you can actually put the bread into the wine and people are served the communion on a spoon uh, with this wine-soaked bread or blood-soaked body, if you want to go to that point, you know, and they're served this from this cup. So that symbol of the three figures around the table that we are invited to, that table is actually an altar. And that cup is actually a chalice. And what's in it is actually the body and blood, which we're invited to consume so as to receive the divine life. That's the sacramental means of receiving the divine life. The initial point is baptism. But the regular maintenance, you might say, is through the Eucharist. That's the continuation and the way in which Christians respond to the command, do this in memory of me. At the end of his words on his body and blood at the Last Supper, Jesus said, do this in memory of me. That's, that's a command. That's part what it, what it means to be entering into the Christian understanding of God in a practical way. Now, at this point, I just want to share with you a bit of my own personal story. I, I've, I've shared with you already a bit about my prayer life, how I use this icon, uh, etc. Um, my, own, my own belief in the Trinity is one that, as I've expressed to you earlier, I've, I've kind of wrestled with on a personal level. Maybe a bishop shouldn't say that, I don't know. But... Uh, but it's true. Uh, you know, like a lot of people, I, being raised in a household of faith, you sort of adopt spiritual practices because that's what your parents teach you and because, you know, that's kind of the routine that you were raised in. And you, I had nothing against it. I was perfectly happy as a kid with that. 
But like a lot of people, I think we go through a, a phase in our life where we're not just believers because we're Christians. We're Christians because we believe. You know, those, those have to be inverse, inverted. We have to have our faith go from something somewhat automatic to really being chosen. And for me, this belief in the Trinity is part of that. And in part, as I say, uh, kicked off that reflection well before I was ever training to be a priest. Kicked off that reflection thanks to the intervention of an Orthodox bishop, Callisto Square. We need reasons for this belief in the Trinity because it's not self-evident. And so the questions I went through at a certain point in my life was, first of all, do I believe in God? It's a good question. I'm sure many of us have asked ourselves that question. And for me, I, to be honest, just to summarize, I decided I didn't have enough faith to be an atheist. Um, because to not believe in God, you have to believe, uh, you know, God is creator. You have to believe that the universe, with all of the order that it possesses, is somehow a random accident. You know? Uh, and that seemed strange to me. If you were to walk in the woods and come across a structure there, and your friend next to you said, isn't this amazing how these red rectangular meteors fell from the sky and landed on top of each other so perfectly? And the heat they generated fused some sand together, sand together to, to create a transparent material in perfect form. And a tree grew up in a rectangular area, but happened to have a metal knob at one point. And all of this happened by, you know, just a, this incredible occurrence of random events. I don't know. I would say, I, I think it's a house. You know, and I would ask myself, who lives there? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go this other way. You know, if a tornado hits a pile of bricks, you don't usually get a house at the end. So the, uh, the, the, the fact of all this order, the beauty of the universe, as a bit of a science geek, the beauty of the universe, you know, really made me think, I, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. So um, that sort of helped me in my belief in God. But that doesn't, like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't necessarily mean God's a trinity. So the next question I ask myself is, do I believe that love is a perfection? In other words, do I believe that love is a good thing? Now, this may sound strange. Most of us would agree that love is a good thing. If you ask little children, do you think love is a good thing? They will look at you funny. Like, what's wrong with you? Of course it's a good thing. But at the same time, you know, sometimes if we overthink things, we can start to say to ourselves, well, maybe love isn't always a good thing. Maybe there are times when it's important to hate. You know, maybe there are times when it's important to, to, to not love, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'll be honest, as someone who exercises pastoral care of people, I often work with people who struggle with difficult situations where love is difficult, or they're not quite sure what is the best way to love. Is there such a thing as tough love, for example? You know, so I can understand that we can sometimes wonder about this. But for myself, I said to myself, okay, if I, if there was this island in the middle of the Atlantic, and on that island lived a people who were perfect in their capacity to love one another, they loved God and loved their neighbor in a perfect way. Would I want to live there? Yes. And that, for me, was sort of the light that said, okay, love really is the ultimate perfection. But if it's a perfection and God is perfect, then God must possess love and possess it in the most perfect way. God must be love. And once we see that God is love, the Trinity is natural. It's a natural conclusion. It's not weird. It's not we don't know how to count. 
it's actually, it makes perfect sense. Sort of my final question for myself, and this related to, you know, my religious life, my religious action, do I believe that self-giving love is the height of the moral life? What does it mean to be a good person? What is the standard for good, if we say we want to be a good person? And I, I realized that the opposite of evil is not good. The opposite, maybe in terms of linguistics it is, but the opposite of evil is actually love. Love is the cure for evil. And that means that if we don't want to be evil, that love, self-giving love, the point where true love, which is concerned first and foremost with the good of the other, to the point of sacrifice, that self-giving love is the height of the moral life. And something that Christians believe Jesus himself exemplified through the cross, through accepting crucifixion out of love. Now, how all that works? Well, you have to invite me back for another talk because we don't have enough time for that. But that is, God so loved the world, he sent his son, and the son so loved the world that he accepted the cross. That's the heart of the Christian moral life, in a sense. In my experience, criticisms of belief in the Trinity, because they do exist, but in my experience, and part of this investigation that I did, those criticisms usually betray a lack of understanding of the Trinity. In other words, when I sit down with somebody and they say, oh, the Trinity is bunk, makes no sense, and then they pull out their objections, I sit there going, eh, well, we came up with an answer to that about 800 years ago, or 1,200 years ago, or 1,900 years ago. So there are objections, and I understand they can be renewed century after century, and I understand because it's a difficult concept, we may reinvent those objections. But I'm speaking personally, part of my own personal quest. Uh, I, I, those points never really criticized the doctrine of the Trinity. They were criticizing what people thought was the doctrine of the Trinity, but never actually the doctrine of the Trinity. As I said before, one could believe in the Trinity without believing that the Word became incarnate in Jesus, but since it is precisely Jesus' claims about himself that led to the Trinitarian doctrine, this would be silly. And so, you know, as I said for myself, I believed in God. I believed that God is love. Coming from that is a belief that God is a Trinity. It's logical. And the belief in the Trinity first came to us through the notion of Jesus incarnate, so it would be silly if I believed that God's a Trinity to not believe in the incarnation of Jesus. So I guess I'm a Christian. You know, and that's where I say, in my own life, I went from sort of being, you know, uh, believing, I, believing because I was a Christian to being Christian because I believed, because of what I believed. Then I became a priest, and now I'm a bishop. What can I say? You know, this has been part of my uh, faith journey, and who knows where it's going to go next. But I, I do know, I have confidence that God is faithful, and if I'm faithful, then I will, I've been promised to share in God's divine life, to share in infinite love for all eternity. That's a pretty good deal, you know. Uh, we have to be faithful in this life, but that kind of teaching fills me with hope. People sometimes wonder, Bishop Tom, the uh, church has so many problems and the world has so many problems. You know, how can you be so, so hopeful? I won't say cheerful. I have my bad days, especially if I don't get a good night's sleep. But, but I'm hopeful because if that's our destiny, the destiny offered, how could you not be? It's the ultimate promise. So what is Christianity, summarized, defined by this doctrine of the Trinity? First of all, God is love, it is his very nature. Two, as God is love, it makes sense that he is a trinity of mutually loving divine persons. 
God has created us out of love to share in the joy of divine life. Why are we here? What's our purpose and meaning? That's it. That's why we exist. Faith in Jesus, by which we receive the Holy Spirit, is the entrance to this life. And the goal of spirituality is to become like God, to live the perfection of self-giving love. That's why we go to church, that's why we pray, that's why we meditate, that's why we read the Bible, that's maybe why we take theology courses, I don't know. But the goal is that, the goal of spirituality. And now I turn it over to our Master of Ceremonies. Thank you.